Book Four, The Church of the Slavers, Part Three, of The Prophets of Religion by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Octopus. Dr. Lyman Abbott published this letter. In his editorial comment thereon he said that he did not know which of two biblical injunctions to follow. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be thought like unto him, or answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. I replied by pointing out a third text which the reverend doctor had possibly overlooked, he that calleth his neighbor a fool shall be in danger of hell-fire. But the reverend doctor took refuge in his dignity, and I bided my time and waited for that revenge which comes sooner or later to us muckrakers. In this case it came speedily. The story is such a perfect illustration of the functions of religion as oil to the machinery of graft, that I ask the reader's permission to recite it at length. For a couple of decades the political and financial life of New England has been dominated by a gigantic aggregation of capital, the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad. It is a Morgan concern. Its popular name, the New Haven, stands for all the railroads of six states nearly all the trolley lines and steamship lines, and a group of the most powerful banks of Boston and New York. It is controlled by a little group of insiders, who followed the custom of railroad wrecking familiar to students of American industrial life, buying up new lines, capitalizing them at fabulous sums, and unloading them on the investing public paying dividends out of capital, passing dividends as a means of stock manipulation, accumulating surpluses, and cutting melons for the insiders, while at the same time crushing labor unions, squeezing wages, and permitting rolling stock and equipment to go to wreck. All these facts were perfectly well known in Wall Street, and could not have escaped the knowledge of any magazine editor dealing with current events. In eight years the New Haven had increased its capitalization 1,501 percent, and what that meant any office boy in the street could have told. What attitude should a magazine editor take to the matter? At that time there were still two or three free magazines in America. One of them was Hampton's, and the story of its wrecking by the New Haven criminals will some day serve in school textbooks as the classic illustration of that financial piracy which brought on the American social revolution. Ben Hampton had bought the old derelict Broadway magazine, with twelve thousand subscribers, and in four years, by the simple process of straight truth-telling, had built up for it a circulation of four hundred and forty thousand. In two years more he would have had a million, but in May, 1911, he announced a series of articles dealing with the New Haven management. The articles, written by Charles Edward Russell, were so exact that they read today like the reports of the Interstate Commerce Commission, dated three years later. A representative of the New Haven called upon the editor of Hampton's with a proof of the first article, obtained from the printer by bribery, and was invited to specify the statements to which he took exception. In the presence of witnesses he went over the article line by line and specified two minor errors which were at once corrected. At the end of the conference he announced that if the articles were published, Hampton's magazine would be on the rocks in ninety days. Which threat was carried out to the letter? 
First came a campaign among the advertisers of the magazine, which lost an income of thousands of dollars a month, almost overnight. And then came a campaign among the banks. The magazine could not get credit. Anyone familiar with the publishing business will understand that a magazine which is growing rapidly has to have advances to meet each month's business. Hampton undertook to raise the money by selling stock, whereupon a spy was introduced into his office as bookkeeper, his list of subscribers was stolen, and a campaign was begun to destroy their confidence. It happened that I was in Hampton's office in the summer of 1911, when the crisis came. Money had to be had to pay for a huge new edition, and upon a property worth two millions of dollars, with endorsements worth as much again, it was impossible to borrow thirty thousand dollars in the city of New York. Bankers, personal friends of the publisher, stated quite openly that word had gone out that any one who loaned money to him would be broken. I myself sent telegrams to every one I knew who might by any chance be able to help, but there was no help, and Hampton retired without a dollar to his name, and the magazine was sold under the hammer to a concern which immediately wrecked it and discontinued publication. THE INDUSTRIAL SHELLEY such was the fate of an editor who opposed the New Haven. And now, what of those editors who supported it? Turn to The Outlook, a weekly journal of current events, edited by Lyman Abbott, the issue of December twenty-fifth, nineteen 1909 years after Christ came down to bring peace on earth and goodwill toward Wall Street. You will there find an article by Sylvester Baxter entitled, The Upbuilding of a Great Railroad. It is the familiar slush article, which we professional writers learn to know at a glance. Prodigious, Mr. Baxter tells us, has been the progress of the New Haven. This was a master stroke that was characteristically sagacious. The road had made prodigious expenditures, and to a noble end. Transportation efficiency epitomizes the broad aim that animated these expenditures and other constructive activities. There are photographs of bridges and stations, vast terminal improvements, a masterpiece of modern engineering, the highest, greatest, and most architectural of bridges. Of the official under whom these miracles were being wrought, President Mellon, we read, Nervously organized, of delicate sensibility, impulsive in utterance, yet with an extraordinarily convincing power for vividly logical presentation. An industrial Shelley, or a Milton, you perceive, and all this prodigious genius poured out for the general welfare. To study out the sort of transportation service best adapted to these ends, and then to provide it in the most efficient form possible, that is the life task that President Mellon has set himself. There was no less than sixteen pages of these raptures, quite a section of a small magazine like the Outlook. The New Haven ramifies to every spot where industry flourishes, where business thrives. As a purveyor of transportation, it supplies the public with just the sort desired. Here we have the new efficiency in a nutshell. In short, here we have what Dr. Lyman Abbott means when he glorifies the great mass of American wealth. It is serving the community. It is building a railway to open a new country to settlement by the homeless. It is operating a railway to carry grain from the harvests of the West to the unfed millions of the East, etc. The unfed millions, 
my typewriter started to write underfed millions, are humbly grateful for these services, and hasten to buy copies of the pious weekly which tells about them. The Outlook runs a column of current events, in which it tells what is happening in the world, and sometimes it is compelled to tell of happenings against the interests of the great mass of American wealth. The cynical reader will find amusement in following its narrative of the affairs of the New Haven during the five years subsequent to the publication of the Baxter article. First came the collapse of the Rhodes service, a series of accidents so frightful that they roused even clergymen and chambers of commerce to protest. A number of the Outlook's subscribers are New Haven commuters, and the magazine could not fail to refer to their troubles. In the issue of January 4, 1913, three years and ten days after the Baxter Rhapsody, we read, The most numerous accidents on a single road since the last fiscal year have been, we believe, those on the New Haven. In the opinion of the Connecticut Commission, the Westport wreck would not have occurred if the railway company had followed the recommendation of the Chief Inspector of Safety Appliances of the Interstate Commerce Commission in its report on a similar accident at Bridgeport a year ago. And by June 28th, matters had gone farther yet. We find the outlook reporting, Within a few hours of the collision at Stamford, the wrecked Pullman car was taken away and burned. Is this criminal destruction of evidence? This collapse of the railroad service started a clamor for investigation by the Interstate Commerce Commission, which of course brought terror to the bosoms of the plunderers. On December twentieth, 1913, we find the outlook putting the soft pedal on the public indignation. It must not be forgotten that such a road as the New Haven is, in fact, if not in terms, a national possession, and as it goes down or up, public interests go down or up with it. But in spite of all pious admonitions, the Interstate Commerce Commission yielded to the public clamor, and an investigation was made, revealing such conditions of rottenness as to shock even the clerical retainers of privilege. Securities were inflated, debt was heaped upon debt, reports the horrified outlook, and when its hero, Mr. Mellon, its industrial Shelley, nervously organized of delicate sensibility, admitted that he had no authority as to the finances of the road, and no understanding of them, but had taken all his orders from Morgan, the outlook remarks, deeply wounded, a pitiable position for the president of a great railway to assume. A little later, when things got hotter yet, we read, in the search for truth, the commissioners had to overcome many obstacles, such as the burning of books, letters, and documents, and the obstinacy of witnesses, who declined to testify until criminal proceedings were begun. The New Haven system has more than three hundred subsidiary corporations, in a web of entangling alliances, many of which were seemingly planned, created and manipulated by lawyers expressly retained for the purpose of concealment or deception. But do you imagine even that would sicken the pious jackals of their offal? If so, you do not know the sturdiness of the pious stomach. A compromise was patched up between the government and the thieves who were too big to be prosecuted. This bargain was not kept by the thieves and President Wilson declared in a public statement that the New Haven administration had broken an agreement deliberately and solemnly entered into. In a manner to the President, inexplicable and entirely without justification. 
which, of course, seemed to the outlook dreadfully impolite language to be used concerning a national possession, it hastened to rebuke President Wilson, whose statement was too severe and drastic. A new compromise was made between the government and the thieves who were too big to be prosecuted, and the stealing went on. Now, as I work over this book, the President takes the railroads for war use, and reads to Congress a message proposing that the securities based upon the New Haven swindles, together with all the mass of other railroad swindles, shall be sanctified and secured by dividends paid out of the public purse. New Haven securities take a big jump, and the outlook, needless to say, is enthusiastic for the President's policy. Here is a chance for the big thieves to baptize themselves, or shall we say to have the water in their stocks made holy? Says our pious editor, for the government to take property without full compensation would be contrary to the whole spirit of America. THE OUTLOOK FOR GRAFT Anyone familiar with the magazine world will understand that such crooked work as this, continued over a long period, is not done for nothing. Any magazine writer would know, the instant he saw the Baxter article, that Baxter was paid by the New Haven, and that the Outlook also was paid by the New Haven. Generally he has no way of proving such facts, and has to sit in silence. But when his board bill falls due and his landlady is persistent, he experiences a direct and earnest hatred of the crooks of journalism who thrive at his expense. If he is a socialist, he looks forward to the day when he may sit on a publication's graft commission, with access to all magazine books which have not yet been burned. In the case of the New Haven, we know a part of the price, thanks to the labors of the Interstate Commerce Commission. Needless to say, you will not find the facts recorded in the columns of the Outlook. You might have read it line by line from the palmy days of Mellon to our own, and you would have got no hint of what the Commission revealed about magazine and newspaper graft. Nor would you have got much more from the great metropolitan dailies, which systematically played down the expose, omitting all the really damaging details. You would have to go to the reports of the Commission, or to the files of Pearson's Magazine, which is out of print and not found in libraries. According to the New Haven's books, and by the admission of its own officials, the road was spending more than $400,000 a year to influence newspapers and magazines in favor of its policies. President Mellon stated that this was relatively less than any other railroad in the country was spending. There was a professor of the Harvard Law School going about lecturing to boards of trade, urging in the name of economic science the repeal of laws against railroad monopolies, and being paid for his speeches out of railroad funds. There was a swarm of newspaper reporters writing on railroad affairs for the leading papers of New England, and getting twenty-five dollars weekly, or two or three hundred on special occasions. Sums had been paid directly to more than a thousand newspapers, three thousand dollars to the boston republic and when the question was asked why the answer was that is mayor fitzgerald's paper even the ultra respectable evening transcript organ of the brahmins of culture was down for a hundred and forty four dollars for typing mimeographing and sending out dope to the country press there was an item of $381 for 15,000 prayers, and when asked about that, President Mellon explained that it referred to a pamphlet called Prayers from the Hills, 
embodying the yearnings of the backcountry people for trolley franchises to be issued to the New Haven. Asked why the pamphlet was called Prayers, Mr. Mellon explained that there was lots of biblical language in it. And now we come to the outlook. After five years of waiting, we catch our pious editors with the goods on them. There appears on the payroll of the New Haven, as one of its regular press agents, getting sums like five hundred dollars now and then, would you think it possible? Sylvester Baxter! And worse yet, there appears an item of nine hundred thirty-eight dollars and sixty-four cents to the outlook for a total of 9,716 copies of its issue of December 25th, 1909 years after Christ came to bring peace on earth and goodwill towards Wall Street. The writer makes a specialty of fair play, even when dealing with those who have never practiced it towards him. He wrote a letter to the editor of the Outlook, asking what the magazine might have to say upon this matter. The reply, signed by Lawrence F. Abbott, president of the Outlook Company, was that the Outlook did not know that Mr. Baxter had any salaried connection with the New Haven, and that they had paid him for the article at the usual rates. Against this statement must be set one made under oath by the official of the New Haven, who had the dispersing of the corruption fund, that the various papers which used the railroad material paid nothing for it, and they all knew where it came from. Mr. Lawrence Abbott states that the New Haven Railroad bought copies of the Outlook without any previous understanding or arrangement, as anybody is entitled to buy copies of the Outlook. I might point out that this does not really say as much as it seems to, for the president of every magazine company in America knows without any previous understanding or arrangement that any time he cares to print an article such as Mr. Baxter's, dealing with the affairs of a great corporation, he can sell 10,000 copies to that corporation. The late unlamented Elbert Hubbard wrote a defense of the Rockefeller slaughter of coal miners, published it in The Fra, and came down to New York and unloaded several tons at 26 Broadway. He did the same thing in the case of the copper strike in Michigan, and again in the case of The Jungle. And all this without the slightest claim to divine inspiration or authority. Mr. Abbott answers another question. We certainly did not return the amount to the railroad company. Well, a sturdy conscience must be a comfort to its possessor. The president of the Outlook is in the position of a pawnbroker caught with stolen goods in his establishment. He had no idea they were stolen, and we might believe it if the thief were obscure. But when the thief is the most notorious in the city, when his picture has been in the paper a thousand times, and when the thief swears that the broker knew him, and when the broker's shop is full of other suspicious goods, why did the outlook practically take back Mr. Spar's revelations concerning the powder barony of Delaware? Why did it support so vigorously the standard oil ticket for the control of the Mutual Life Insurance Company, and with James Stillman, one of the heads of Standard Oil, president of Standard Oil's big bank in New York, secretly one of its biggest stockholders? Also, why does the magazine refuse to give its readers a chance to judge its conduct? Why is it that a search of its columns reveals no mention of the revelations concerning Mr. Baxter, not even any mention of the $400,000 slush fund of its paragon of transportation virtues? I asked that question in my letter, and the president of the Outlook Company for some reason failed to notice it. 
I rode a second time, courteously reminding him of the omission, and also of another, equally significant. He had not informed me whether any of the editors of the Outlook, or the officers or directors of the company, were stockholders in the New Haven. His final reply was that the question seemed to him wholly unimportant. He does not know whether the Outlook published anything about the Baxter revelations, nor does he know whether any of the editors or officers or directors of the Outlook Company are or ever have been stockholders of the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad Company. The fact would not in the slightest degree affect either favorably or unfavorably our editorial treatment of that corporation. Caesar's wife, it appears, is above suspicion, even when she is caught in a brothel. End of Book 4, Part 3